Luke chapter 23. Anybody ever seen The Passion of the Christ or, or what's that new uh, series about Jesus? Uh, the Chosen. Anybody seen any movie like that? So if you picture, this is the scene and this is the part in the Bible and history where Jesus is crucified. He's at the cross. The reason he came to earth to bring salvation, he's at the cross. And we have this scene where there's, it's not just one cross, but how many crosses, how many people are being crucified? You've got three people in this hill called Skull. And this is where we get to in Luke chapter 23, verse 39. This is what it says. One of the criminals, so we, Jesus is in the middle, in between two criminals. And it says, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah? You're the chosen one? You're the anointed one? You're the Christ? Are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. He's just being sarcastic. Just if, if you're the son of God, what are you doing there? If you could save yourself, save us as well, right? Verse 40 says, but the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God? Even when you have been sentenced to die. We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. So once again, get this picture in your head. Jesus is in between two criminals. They deserve to die, right? The, the, the cross was the way the Roman Empire sentenced to death criminals, especially Jews. It, it was such a, such a diminishing death and such a horrible death that not even the Romans wouldn't crucify Roman citizens. They, they wouldn't crucify their own people because it was so horrible. It was, the Bible actually says, curse be the man who hangs on a tree. By a tree meaning wood, the cross. Jesus became a curse so that you could be blessed. Jesus became a curse on the cross so that you may now have access to God, have this salvation. And then Jesus is in between these two criminals. And one of them is just, he's got nothing to lose. He's being a clown. He tells him, hey, listen. Jesus had a title on top of his head that said, the king of the Jews. He was being mocked. He says, listen, didn't you proclaim to be a prophet, the son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the savior of the world? Now look at you. Save yourself if that's true, right? Or save us. And the other criminal says, don't you fear God? Even when you're sentenced to die because of something that you deserve, you're still mocking this man. He didn't do anything to deserve this. I want to ask you a question tonight. If you were to die tonight and you stood before God, what would you say? If you were to die tonight, you went into the presence of God, what would you say? If we answer, because, right, if, if you're surprised you're in heaven, then you got to check your heart tonight. But if you wake up in heaven and you stand before God and you tell him, well, uh, first of all, thank you. I didn't know I was going to make it, but thank you. But if you answer in the first person, then we're immediately wrong. If you say, well, I'm here because I had faith. I'm here because I went to church. I'm here because I gave money. I'm here because I served. I'm here because I came to Zoe Youth on Wednesday nights. When you answer in first person, it's already the wrong answer. The only right answer is in the third person. When we can say, well, I'm here because he did it for me. I'm here because of Jesus. I'm, be I'm here because he gave his life for me. I'm here because I did not deserve this grace, this gift given by God. And yet he loved me so that he died on the cross for me. The only right answer is on the third person. I'm here because of Jesus. I'm here. I don't deserve to be here. I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. I can't walk on a straight line. But because of Jesus. I have this access to God. And when I look at yourselves, and I tell you this often, I look at myself when I was your age and growing up in church. And it's awesome that you're here, that you're coming to church. I see all of you guys coming on Sunday with your families. That's the right thing. That's the right way. But a lot of times at your age, you feel like, man, I feel like this, this Bible stuff, I don't get it. Or does God really listen to my prayers because I feel like I mess up. And let me tell you something. God does not see Ages, God does not see races. God does not see whether you're a man or a woman. God sees your heart. Just because you're young, it doesn't mean that God doesn't hear your prayers. The only prayer that, God's, that God doesn't hear is the one you don't make. 
But you're at a point in your life where if you don't set the right foundation, you're going to mess up the rest of your life. And when you can come to a point where you can say, well, it's not because of me, right? I, I can't, there's nothing good enough that I could do in my life to please God. You know the only place in the Bible that says that God is pleased by something we do? It's in the book of Hebrews where it says that he is pleased by your faith when you believe in the middle of the struggle, in the middle of a hard day, in the middle of, of just being frustrated, in the middle of just having a bad day in school. And, and I saw somebody with a shirt that says, I hate bullying. In the middle of being bullied, in the middle of, of just feeling like, like you're just, I failed a life. That's when we need faith the most. Not when you're doing good. Not when you got a thousand bucks for Christmas and, 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 and your birthday because they both were on the same day. You don't need a lot of faith when... Your parents are great and they don't fight. And you don't need a lot, of, a lot of faith when there's food on the table, when you're going to Disney once a month, when you're getting the stuff that you ask for, that when you have a video game at home where your parents have a car to take you to school, you don't got to take the bus, you got to walk. You don't need a lot of faith there. You know where we need faith the most? It's in the valley, in the desert, where you hear your parents fighting at night and you're like, oh, my God, what's going on? When you don't know if... if you're ever going to go on a vacation this year because things re seem really tough at home. When you don't know if you're, right, you're going to summer school and like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to make it to my next grade next year. It's in those moments when we need to have faith in God the most. And he's pleased when you do have faith. When you believe that he's going to come through. When you believe that he's going to do something. Because listen, there's a lot of things that you can do in your own strength, with your own abilities. But I don't know about you, but I'm tired of trying to fight in things by myself and trying to work on my own strength. I need God supernaturally to intervene in my life, in my family. To do the, only, to do the impossible that only he can do. Now, I love this story when we see this Steve on the cross. Because he never went to Bible school. He never went to a connect group. He never went to Zoe Youth. He never, he doesn't know what the doctrine of justification is. He never... Probably never gave money at church. He never got baptized. But he made it. Jesus said, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. Imagine just this guy dying and coming up to heaven. He sees an angel and he's like, on what basis are you here? The angel asked the thief, right? On what merit are you here? And he's like, well, uh, I don't know. The, the guy in between me on the cross said I could be here. And the angel's like, well, well let me talk to my supervisor because uh, did you make a confession of faith? Oh, and the, the guy's like, what is that? Uh, did you go to church? Uh, no, I mean, the man on the cross, the man in the middle told me that I could be here. This guy, this thief had faith in Jesus, and that's all it takes on what basis are you here? And there's only one answer is that there's nothing good enough that we could do to deserve the grace of God. You can't, there's not enough money. There's not enough service. There's not enough good behavior that you can give to God in order to earn salvation, in order to earn his grace. But there's just a gift that he gives to us if we have faith in him. Check out this last Bible verse, Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says, for it is by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. Listen, guys. You might come to church your whole life and not be saved. You might be here, but your mind might be at home. Might be, I don't know, somewhere else. Let me tell you something tonight. Be present. Be present. The Bible says that the wages of sin, the penalty of our sin is death. All men have sinned and have been separated from God. But there's good news. Jesus made a way. Jesus died at the cross so that you didn't have to. In fact, and those are not just the good news that Jesus died at the cross. He rose again the third day. You know that the cross really shows us that Jesus was in fact a man. He died. But the open tomb shows us that he was actually God. Because he rose again. He had the power to come back from the death. And he did that because he loved you. Now, you weren't just saved for something, from something. 
you were saved for something. If we would just receive Jesus in our hearts, then why don't we die right there and then? Right? The reason that we're saved is not just so we go to heaven. It's not just so we get our lives right. But God has a purpose for your life. God has a dream for your life. And I don't know if, you're, if somebody has ever told you that you're not good enough. If someone has ever told you that you're not going to make it because of your family history, because of what you've been through, you won't make it. Let me tell you something. The devil is a liar. God loves you. God has a purpose for your life. Before you were even born, he knew you. He knew your name. In fact, when Jesus was hanging at the cross, he was thinking about you. And I want you to make that personal tonight. Right, there we are. Just close your eyes. And let me just say this. You don't have to make a confession of faith every time we, we ask you. Hopefully that makes sense. You don't have to get saved every time we make that call in just because you've messed up. Let me give you some bad news. You're going to mess up the rest of your life. But as long as we have this life of confessing our sins, of returning to Jesus, of saying, Lord, I'm sorry for the things that I've messed up, where I fell, where I've missed the mark. I need you in my life. But let me just say this tonight. All men have sinned. And sin separates us from God. Now, we shouldn't follow God or give our lives to Jesus because of our sin. That we're scared of hell over an eternity away from God. But we give our lives to Jesus because we love him. Because that's our answer back to him. If he loved me enough to give his life for me at the cross, then I will love him enough to give him my life here on earth. You see, the thief at the cross, he didn't went to church, he didn't get baptized. But that was his penalty. He died. He was a thief. He was a criminal. But now you guys have a responsibility because you're not criminals. You're not going to die. God is calling you to go deeper, to serve him, to get baptized, to seek him, to get involved, to use your only life, to use your youth for his glory. I'm tired of seeing youth dying out there, committing suicide, getting involved in car accidents, dying because of a drug overdose. I'm tired of that. That's why I'm proud of you that you're here. Now start giving your time, your talent, your treasure to God and see him work and do great things in your life. Now we're going to pray. Now you can close your eyes. And if you're here tonight, you say, well, well, I've never really made Jesus the Savior of my life. Or I'm not sure whether I'm saved or not. It just takes some faith in your heart and a confession in your mouth. And if that's you tonight, I want you to lift up your hand. And I'm going to pray with you. You say, Juan, well, I want to receive Jesus in my heart. And you can just raise your hand there where you are. We're going to pray. I see you. You can put it down. You can put down your hand. And right there in your heart, you don't even have to scream it out loud. Just say, Jesus, I need you. Be my Lord and Savior. God, help me. I need you in my life. Holy Spirit, show me the way. Now let me pray. Father God, tonight we're aware that you're here in this place. But we first thing we want to say, Lord, is sorry for missing the mark. But the second thing we want to say is thank you because you've given it all for us. Thank you, God, because you love me so much that you will never leave me nor forsake me. Thank you, God, that you never change. And your promises are always yes and amen. And you want the best for my life. Now, God, I pray your blessing upon every single person in this room, Lord. Your grace and favor, opening doors. God, fixing our problems, answering our prayers. Lord, answer our prayers. I pray, Lord, for anybody with a burden tonight, with a broken heart, with a heaviness on their shoulders that shouldn't be there, Lord. I pray that you bring peace, that you bring healing, that you bring clarity. But above anything else, Lord, that your love may overtake our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Amen. God is good. You guys excited?